It is the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very glad to see you here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation. Now, before we can start that conversation, let me introduce the program. And just on a meta note, for those of you who have been to the Future Trends Forum before, uh, these introductions are a bit substantial. Would you be interested in me cutting them down? Um, that is, maybe pointing to uh, an external video or having the introductions happen before the top of the hour? Just let me know in the chat or, or elsewhere. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Rebecca Pope Rourke. Uh, she is a really, really important person in American higher education for my money. Uh, she is a scholar, a tenured faculty member, who now also runs a consulting enterprise called Agile Faculty, where she tries to basically help faculty survive and thrive in this increasingly chaotic 21st century. Um, so we're really glad to have her here so she can talk to us about the question of how to balance the stresses, demands, pressures, opportunities of academic life with the rest of our lives. Greetings, Professor Pope Roark. <laughs> Hi, how are you, Brian? Thanks for having me. Great to have you, Rebecca. Welcome. Where, where are you there? Are you really in Atlanta right now? Yes, I am. Well, technically I'm in Smyrna, but pretty much okay. Atlanta, yes. That's Georgia right. Tech is in the middle of Atlanta. Oh, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're safe and sound. I mean, yes, you're, in a, you're in a hot zone right now, so mm -hmm. please please take care. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I know that in academia, we can, we can burn up hours with introductions and, and opening <laughs> throat clearing. And, and so I like to cut to the chase and ask a question that's, uh, I, I think, more revelatory, uh, which is to ask for the next, say, academic year, you know, the next eight months or so, mm -hmm. what are you going to be spending most of your time working on and thinking about? Um, I think, like a lot of us, um, I'm now at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Georgia Tech after 12 years on the faculty at Elon University. And uh, like oh. most of us, we're preparing for the fall, which our students are arriving. Classes start on Monday. So we've been working all summer to make sure that our faculty feel supported and somewhat ready to get started with the fall, um, mm. given mm. the great uncertainty and, and health concerns um, and other concerns that are really traumatizing all of us to a certain extent, right? So how do we um, how do we help our faculty share the humanity with their students and be accepting of the humanity of, of themselves as well and share that with their students? Um, so uh, that's what I'm doing in my typical uh, day job. Um, on the side, uh, the thing that I'll be spending most of my, my time in on is I'm currently writing a book called Professor Burnout. Mm -hmm. um, the book is kind of a, a, a hybrid of genres, which has been really interesting to write. So it's part my memoir of going through burnout and coming through that. It mm -hmm. has stories, narratives from other folks who have been through burnout in higher education, as well as um, advice chapters from faculty developers, um, coaches, psychologists, and um, a bunch of reflection activities and, and ways that you can think about um, maybe how you might move through burnout or how you might be able to avoid it. Um, as a faculty member. So that, and then I'm also running a, um, a small group coaching program called Professor Burnout, um, a six week program as well for um, women academics. So that's pretty much how I'm spending my time these days. This is enough for 10 people. And uh, <laughs> good, good luck with, uh, with the newest book and good luck with that group, which is widely needed and good luck supporting all these faculty who are going through an incredibly challenging chaotic time. Yes, yes. thank you. Well, we, we invited you here to um, uh, talk about the uh, balance between academic academic life and, and mm -hmm. the rest of life. Mm -hmm. and I, I know you work with faculty, but I, I'd like to, if we could, include also uh, staff and maybe students as part of that as well. Mm -hmm. right. um, so if I could ask, before COVID hit, mm -hmm. you know, before the virus came roaring out of Hubei province, what what would you tell people about? What was your advice then about how to balance these things and stay sane? Um, largely, I think it was my advice would have been to recognize the culture that's driving many of us in certain ways. Um, we, faculty especially, tend to be a specific group of people who all come together 
because of similar um, interests and identities. So it can get really easy to get caught up in the higher ed rat race of constant competition really with each other. Um, constantly feeling like you have to prove your, prove your worth to jump to the yeah. next level, whatever that level might be. Um, mm -hmm comparing yourself to the people around you at your institution and in your discipline there's always someone who's going to be doing more than you are how do you how do you kind of avoid that while also avoiding the compassion fatigue of putting so much of yourself into the work and into working with your students as well so my advice always is to um, to step back a little bit and to look at that more holistically um, talk to someone who isn't in higher education about kind of the experience that you're having, um, whether that's a, a counselor or, or a faculty member. I talk to my husband about it all the time um, in ways that help me get some perspective on what's going on. So I think it is being very aware that while an amazing place with so much potential to impact lives that higher ed is, it is also a culture that we need to be aware of and we need to understand the way it pushes us in certain directions and decide if where we want to put our boundaries, right? Where are your boundaries? And I don't necessarily think there's a there's a work slash life in this because yeah. academic work can really take over your life if you let it. And that's what happened mm -hmm. to me. Um, mm -hmm. But so I think Honestly, I think it's about boundaries and figuring out how to be content <laughs> with what you're doing right now, rather than that constant competition and academic capitalism that seems to drive us. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's a whole. I can see why you do this professionally. That was a, <laughs> that was a small book you just you just told us right there, um, with many many chapters. Um, I, I can see that, especially with that the cultural competition is so ferocious mm -hmm. all over the place. I mean, very mm -hmm. institution, institution, field, the field, but. Uh, but it's so it's so deep, and it really can swallow everything up. Um, that's a that's a very very good point. Well, you have all of that very sane advice, <laughs> and then February twenty twenty happened, and then March. And now, what can you tell us? How can we keep sane under uh, under the virus? Um, I, I think my um, my mantra at this point is it's okay to not to not be okay, um, and to you know, I, I hate to call it a silver lining, but one of the things that I've seen coming out of our faculty and that I've seen coming out on, on social media is, is a level of humanity and vulnerability that faculty members and students may have not necessarily shared with each other in the past, um, because we all share this context together. We all share this, um, this traumatic event that the stress, it's unrelenting stress from the pandemic um, and the the racial injustices and the rightful protesting of those over the summer. So we're con there's a constant onslaught of the stress right now. Um, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay not to write anything. Right? Mm. You are not on vacation. And I know that fall's coming up anyway, but over the summer, I've been telling people you're not on vacation. I heard someone say once that you're not working from home, you're working from the safety of your home in a global crisis. Mm. That is a very different way of thinking mm. about where you are and what you're doing. Um, and, you know, there are some folks who have been very prolific over the summer, and that's awesome, right? If that's the way that, that you deal and that you're, you know, that you're working through, that's awesome. But for those of you who aren't, good for you for doing what you need to keep yourself sane. And it's also, I think it's also a matter of being willing to acknowledge that humanity, right? We are people who come with our whole selves into the workplace, regardless of maybe the identity that we crafted for ourselves on our campus. We are all human beings and we're interacting with each other with a level of vulnerability that we may not have in the past. Um, and we're also we're also interacting with our students or we, we are going to be yeah. interacting with them more and more mm. um, over the fall as we all traverse the uncertainty of, of what might happen with the semester. There's so much uncertainty, there's fear, there's anxiety, right? So, so how do we address those and not just, not just whitewash over them, right? This is, these are important mental health issues in addition to the physical health issues that we're all concerned about. So being able to talk to someone um, that's a peer or a colleague, being able to just kind of open up with your students and saying, this is weird. I, you know, I'm as concerned as you are. Let's do this together and see what we can accomplish together. Um, I think students are really looking for that humanity from us um, as we're going to be getting more of their humanity in ways that we haven't in the past. And we're going to have to learn, we're going to have to learn as well to, to support our students in that. 
Um, yeah. But also to balance that so we don't end up so far over into compassion fatigue that we can't support each other anymore. So, uh, you know, we've got some boundary issues there again. Well, compassion fatigue is a real thing. Um, yes. has this, this reciprocal nature of exchanging our, our humanity and our vulnerability. I, I have some questions, but I want to encourage everybody to ask their questions. And uh, we already have a couple that have just come in. So let me just uh, put a few of these up. Uh, one is from Raj. Uh, Devasaganam uh, from Sunil Westbury, who says, these endless work days will leave emotional remnants. What advice did your guest have? Mm -hmm. I live at work now. Is this good for my employer? Good question. I'm going to take the first two thirds of that and maybe leave the employer, the employer okay. piece off. Well, I'll put it back um, up on the screen. Uh, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think it actually, it comes down to boundaries again. And it comes down to rituals in a way, right? Ooh. So this is the space where I work. When I walk into this space, right. I'm at work. When I leave this space, I'm leaving work. Um, I know folks who will actually like walk out the door of their home and walk around the block and huh. then come back in to kind of mark that, that change huh. over. That's um, a good idea. Right. And I think I think it's important to, if you can, have a zone where you work so that that's where the work happens so that you don't track it all over your home, if that's possible. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of, of privilege associated with that, having a one space and um, having enough space maybe to separate mm -hmm. yourself from other family members, if that's that's an mm -hmm. option for you. There, there is definitely a certain level of, of privilege associated with that. Um, but I think it's you know, it's that the advice you get in college to not work on your bed. You should sleep in your bed and work at your desk. <laughs> right? I never got that advice. Oh, yeah. too bad. That's so a good idea. I, yeah. So I've been kind of thinking about it like that. Where can you place actual physical boundaries <clears throat> um, to where you work and where you don't work? And then yeah. also what rituals can you use to mark the day so that you can transition in and out of that work mm -hmm. back into your home as your home, not as your workspace? That's a great answer, um, and and Raj, thank you for that uh, mm -hmm. question. But Raj also asked in a question: Is this good for my employer? And that's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know if I want to touch that one with a ten foot pole. <laughs> well, I mean, could you could you say that? I mean, faculty that are less manic, that are less stressed, that are less terrified, become um, better employees overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty and I'm hearing things from from different institutions all over the country about faculty maybe not necessarily knowing what they are able to do or how much control they have over their classroom if they're supposed to be meeting face to face or socially distancing, um, if they are quote unquote, allowed to, to, to run their classes fully remotely as a personal choice. Um, and there's a lot of, of mm -hmm. Politicking is the wrong word, but there's a lot of layers to those decisions. Um, I, friends who have gone back into the classroom already are saying how much their students really want to be there and they're excited to be there. But two hours of class just wipes my friend, faculty, my faculty member friends out, right? It's, yeah. it's exhausting um, to teach through a mask, right? To try to maintain the things that you, you would usually, those relationships that you would build with our students, um, the ability to read the room, which is gone. Um, it's gone in face-to-face -face as well as it is. I know folks are, are kind of commenting on that it's difficult to read the room in a, in a remote class online. Um, if everybody's wearing masks, that's difficult as well. Um, so, I think that if you have a good setup and your employer is supportive and you care about your own health and you care about your students' health, yes, you are going to be a better employee. Um, but I think for me at this point, I want focus. I would like folk, people to just focus on being a good human being. A good human being. Taking care of each other. Thank you, thank you. And again, Raj, thank you for the full question. In, um, in chat, uh, David Drake, who I, I love to ask if he's a science fiction writer, he says, uh, there have been ample studies showing that if you actually try to do less, you end up producing more meaningful work. So rest, he advises. Take care of your physical and emotional state. Yeah. I've got to figure out how to do it myself. Mm -hmm. But there are, um, there are other questions that I want to make sure everyone else gets to, uh, gets to ask those. Um, this is one that comes from Charles Finley at Northeastern. And Charles asks, you use the term academic capitalism. Can you expand on how that manifests? Sure. And this is a term that I only came across maybe a year ago um, from a webinar. And if you think about the way that 
academics think about their time, right? Um, it's very common for us to say, I'm wasting my time, I should be writing right now, right? I should be writing is a meme at this point. Um, we should always be writing. If we're not writing, we feel guilty. If we're not grading, we feel guilty. There's this sense that we are, our time is money and we're wasting it, or time is capital where we could be producing something rather than really thinking about, well, do I wanna produce something right now? Is that, you know, is there something that I want to say or do I feel like I just have to do this? I have to take on more. I have to spend every minute that I have to advance my career up through the economic chain, right? Which is in a lot of ways is just our hierarchical chain. Um, uh, if you're tenure track up that path, if there are other paths that you're on that, that you're kind of striving for, there's a really, there's a good database of uh, or a backlog of um, sources on academic capitalism. And I can share some of the, the, um, the bibliography I've been building with Brian and possibly oh. share later. Um, yeah. But it's definitely not a term that I came up with, but I think it really, it encapsulates the way I always felt guilty if I wasn't doing something related to work, right? I couldn't relax because I should be writing. Um, there was that constant guilt and shame, honestly, for not feeling like I could do anything right now. Um, and I think the folks who, um, especially now, have been uh, earlier in the pandemic who were were kind of really upset that they couldn't write or they couldn't be productive during that mm -hmm. time, that's a shame that's driven not by us as individuals, but by a culture that values our worth as an academic based on how much productivity we produce, how much, how, pr how productive that we are, right? And uh, I mean, if that's not capitalism, I'm not sure what is, right? So um, are we... Are we, are we willing to be cogs in that machine still, you know? And the machine is changing. Who knows what's going to happen um, yeah. when we eventually come out of this? So this might be an opportunity for us to really take a hard look at that um, and the opportunity cost there. If you, um, th thank you for saying that. Um, in the chat, they just had a, a string of comments of people talking about guilt and uh, remembering that. I also just shared a, a book from. Uh, my publisher, uh, Johns Hopkins University Press, mm -hmm. called Academic Capitalism and the New Economy Yeah, by uh, mm -hmm. Sheila Slaughter and my friend Gary Rhodes. Mm -hmm. um, and Gary was actually a guest on the program before. Um, so we'd be, uh, I'd definitely point to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Greg also adds that uh, attention span suffers in trauma. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Um, I, I'm picking on Greg in part because today is his birthday. And so we should all say, Aww. happy birthday happy to Greg. Birthday. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the forum for that. But Greg had a, um, a question, okay. <clears throat> a very practical question, which is, uh, we expect faculty to be the primary contact with students also experiencing trauma. What advice do you have for those instructors who may not be trained as therapists? Yeah, thanks, Greg, for that. And Professor Burnout is actually under contract with um, Johns Hopkins and Greg. So thank you very much for, <laughs> for your continued support, Greg. Um, I think a lot of it has to come down to you recognizing that you are not a trained counselor. Um, for example, I am not a mental health professional. I am a person who has gone through burnout. I am a faculty member who's, who's kind of lived through the culture and has made some decisions about how I'm going to live in that culture. Um, I've got some coaching training under my belt, but my goal is just to kind of normalize talking about some of these issues rather mm. than to help people solve them them, you know, we can direct them in certain ways. And I think that's the same with our students. We are not counselors. And I think, I don't think a lot of our students want us to be counselors. I think a lot of them just want to feel heard. They want to feel validated that it's okay to be scared right now, um, that it's okay to maybe not do your best on a test because something happened um, or, or other ways like that where, where they do need to be vulnerable. They need to feel heard and they need to feel not judged right now. Um, so once we can achieve that with our students and be able to listen to them in that way, then we can direct them potentially to the right person where they might find that counseling or they might find the support that they need. Um, and, and that could be anything from, you know, a, a peer group of students who meets socially distant or virtually to talk about these kinds of things. Um, or it could be counseling, right? It, you know, depending on what that spectrum is, we can present our students with the options once we've listened to them and then they are technically adults, so then they would have to 
um, do what they would like with that. With that, and then we also, most institutions, mine, I know we were just recently talking about this. You know, have excellent referral systems, right? If you're worried about a student, refer them to you know Student Life um, or Student Affairs, and those offices. That's what they're there for, to support those students and to make sure that they're okay. And they're trained to do that in ways that most faculty members are not. So tap the network because everyone at your institution wants to help your students. Well, Greg, thank you for that question. Uh, he also publishes a really good book on um, uh, mental health counseling and higher education. But I have to ask, to, to come back to the institutional level um, as part of this, um, what do you see is happening in terms of campus mental health services, given the demand is skyrocketing, mm -hmm. but also skyrocketing our financial problems mm -hmm. for institutions? Um, but, yeah. but uh, uh, okay, I'll ask that question first. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, that's a, a huge issue. Um, on, on one hand, I think we were already starting to scale up our mental health care for our students. In the last couple of years, well-being has become um, a, a huge topic. How do we make sure that we build learning environments where students can learn, um, where they feel comfortable learning, where they feel challenged, but not overwhelmed and anxious that can lead to negative mental health um, outcomes. So I think on, on the average, we were ramping those up anyway. Um, and at this point, with all of the concern and all of the uncertainty, I think many of us may be taking on more of those listener roles than we have in the past. Um, um, and then I think we're just, it's one of those things where we're all just gonna, I think, have to pitch in or you know support our student services as much as we can so that our students get the help that we can. I wish there was a good answer for that question. Sure. Um, I, I definitely have not seen a consistent response um, across institutions right now, um, but I, you know, th I think, I think luckily some of those those initiatives were already ramping up, so maybe some systems are in are better in place now to leverage different tools that may not be kind of one on one counseling care, um, but have a have a much bigger suite of tools that we can offer students um, even in this context. Well, thank you. That's a that's a great answer for my very pokey institutional question. And now I'm going <laughs> to make it worse, and then I'm going to go get out of the way, <laughs> which is. Um, uh, and a few people have been talking about this in chat, including uh, Luisa Saladino Cool, um, who, who said, well, should we, you ask us not to judge students as much. Mm -hmm. um, so Luisa and Tom Haynes both said, we should have fewer tests. Um, and I, I think I think by test, I think they also mean other as formal assessments that have a grade attached to them with stress. Sure. Um, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think we'll see that? Um, I know that's what we're recommending, um, very much so that um, what makes sense in having maybe three exams, um, tech for example, is an engineering school and that's pretty traditional in those fields that maybe the courses evaluations are, you know, two midterms and a final exam, right? And, th and that's the way that that's traditionally done. Um, there are so many other issues associated with our context now that problematize that. Anxiety is absolutely one of them. Um, and then there's also, there's student issues that we never had to think about before, right? The students did not sign up to, up for an online program, right? Typically when you sign up for an online program, you when paying tuition, you're saying, I have stable internet access, I have the right computer equipment, you mm -hmm. know, so I can succeed in this program with, with the technologies that I have. That's not true of every student. Um, you know, we, I know that our library has been loaning out um, and sending students tablets and notebooks. There are stories of students who are sitting outside of Starbucks trying to get Wi-Fi access. Um, and we also have, we also have international students who could be halfway around the world. So if you're trying to give a synchronous test at 1 p.m. Atlanta time, that could be 1 a.m. in China. Oh, absolutely. If the student's halfway around the world. And, you know, honestly, We've been talking about the fact that, it, you know, if, if one of our students is in rural Georgia, just trying to find stable internet access could be a challenge. Um, so Definitely. we are, yeah, we are suggesting lower stakes as much as possible. And those can be scaffolded really easily to get to some sort of final product or some way that, that um, allows students to demonstrate their mastery of the content. Um, we're just doing it over time in ways that we might not have before. Right, that there's not one or the other that's better. And I personally, I think the research shows that when students do have lower stakes formative assessments moving toward a larger summative assessment, they will do better. 
because they have opportunities. You know, if, if you have a three test scheme like that and you average the grades at the end of the semester, you can have a student on that first exam who does terribly, but they, they work really hard and they get, you know, they, they learn and it, it just clicks one time, but right. their grade is then damaged because they didn't get it at first. Right. Right. So if you get a really low grade on that first one and then the other two are high, you're still going to end up with a middling grade, which isn't necessarily um, fair to that student. If you want to call it fair, it also doesn't show what they know. So they have the opportunity to play a little bit more, experiment a little bit more um, with lower stakes assessments and to take some risks in a way that they're not going to as they're preparing for large scale exams. And I think that that goes regardless of whether you're doing traditional face to face or online remote emergency that, right now. Okay. Thank you. That's that's a really really good answer. Um, you've triggered a whole like barrage of conversation in the chat. Oh. Um, <laughs> out of control. Everything from um, Lisa Durf uh, telling us that Panera has better Wi-Fi than Starbucks. Noted. Um, to uh, David Hool, who says that he employs formative testing through presentations, group projects, and written assignments, and stays away from summative assignments. Um, Sarah San Gregorio cheers for scaffolding. Mm -hmm. uh, Roxanne Riskin uh, is just on fire. She shared with us a, a free online class on awesome. psychological uh, first aid, which looks good, uh, sharing hotspots. And uh, we have some recommendations for other books, including uh, Cal Newport's uh, Deep mm -hmm. Work. And then yeah. Sarah added to this more. My gosh, this is just great. <laughs> the Knowledge Factory by Stanley oh, wow. Aronowitz. Mm -hmm and strongly recommends this. Yeah, I actually taught that in a first year writing class um, 20 years ago. <laughs> did, you, did it go over well? Yeah, it was a business themed first year writing class. So, ah. so we talked ah. about that a lot. It was, a, I forgot all about that book. Thanks for the reminder. Well, thank you, Sarah. Sarah's wonderful. Um, and <laughs> we have we have more questions. Those of you who are cutting loose in the chat, just again, if you want, just uh, you know, either hit the, cue, the question button so we can fling it up on stage or join us uh, with video. You can see that we're, we're pretty nice. Um, <laughs> pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> we had uh, um, uh, another question from Roxanne, which goes back a little bit. Um, and this is um, about your group for women. Is there a group of male professors and also any well-being sessions, resources, or practices at no cost available for staff and faculty? Oh, wow. Um... I am not aware of a group for male faculty specifically related to burnout. Um, yeah. You know, and, and there are lots of coaching programs um, offered by folks who specialize in coaching academics. Mm. Um, you know, and I think we might traditionally think of those coaches more as writing coaches or dissertation coaches, but mm -hmm. as coaching field deepens um, and, you know, has more accountability to licensing and things like that. People are going much deeper um, with one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, group coaching in different ways. Um, I just I decided to um, limit my particular group to women, just because I had a I had a, a client that I was talking to, and she really wanted to do it, but she was worried that a man in the group might cause her to hold back when she really needed to kind of share some emotions with people. Um, and so that's why I chose to do it. That was her um, perspective on that. And I think it worked really well. Um, that doesn't mean we can't create them for male faculty, right? I mean, that, that's just a different set of how we approach, I think, the issues of burnout and well-being. Um, I'm going to name check Brené Brown once and not, you know, too much. But, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with her work on vulnerability, she's only recently and in, in, in maybe the last five or six years started looking at male vulnerability. Um, and, and what that looks like and, and why, why male figures may not feel like they have the same bandwidth to be vulnerable in relationship to each other, let alone to the women in their lives. Um, so I think that's probably a, a different set of skills. In terms of what's available free, I would probably have to think about that. I would think, I would check in and see what's available with different institutions with their employee um, oh. I forget what you call them, the EMPs or the, the Employee mm -hmm. Assistance Programs, the EAPs. Um, mm -hmm. Check and see what's available there. I know that at my previous institution, they had started partnering with the local hospital and they were starting to have some, some sessions about stress and overload and um, burnout for faculty and staff. So, you know, maybe some of those partnerships, um, community partnerships could be viable options um, if you're community connected at your institution. Um, but off the top of my head, I feel like I kind of see things coming and whizzing past um, because I follow certain people on social media and I kind of know where to look 
um, but I'm not sure how far those those messages are reaching outside of that, that little cohort. I think that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. A uh, long time, long time friend of the program. Uh, and that's a really, really good answer. Uh, and friends, if you want, if this is something that we should do a follow up session on, just let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, also I just mm -hmm. threw this in the chat. Um, one topic that we look at from time to time uh, is gaming. Uh, and games for education. Uh, and a wonderful grad student, Kate Kirby, uh, wrote a couple of uh, games that explore what it would be like to teach this fall in a face-to-face -face oh, yeah. class. And they're, they're very, very moving. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're not, they're not lighthearted. Um, mm -hmm. She's, uh, I'm, I'm impressed if, for her doing that. Um, yeah. uh, we have more questions just piling up, Rebecca. <laughs> see why why agile faculty is so much in demand um, and this goes back to a couple let's see we have, these go back to a couple of your other points here's okay. one from uh this is from todd russell who wants to know what you think of the idea of contract grading i know there's some interest from some in higher ed mm -hmm. yeah there's a there's a good cohort of people who are doing that especially if you're doing team-based learning um in that context i have done contract grading um as a faculty member um and I appreciated it because it was um, it wasn't less grading, but the the the, um, the criteria and the heuristics were a little more concrete, right? Because you're kind of looking at you're trying to meet certain standards, but it might be in terms of quantity and then getting feedback and revising and things like that. Um, so I've appreciated it in terms of it being formative in many ways. Students can have different opportunities to continue to work. Um, on certain assignments or problem sets or whatever that was, um, it gives them the opportunity to to take some risks and a play because it's not that kind of one and you're done. Um, I found just in my personal experience, just students were confused. Um, and really? yes, wow. the, the, the students didn't understand um, why they weren't necessarily just getting a letter grade or a number grade over time. Um, so it, it takes them it takes some enculturation for the students to understand what you're doing and why you're doing um, it. You know, I had to explain it to the students repeatedly uh, when they were confused and that was fine. It was, it was different than what they were used to. They're used to kind of shooting for a grade or getting what is quote unquote given to them, um, whatever it is that they earn. Um, so I, I like contract grading. It is a completely different way kind of, of thinking about your course. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's something that you jump into without maybe testing the waters, maybe like on one assignment or something like that, um, or a, a course that you have taught a hundred times and are very comfortable with, and you can play with it in that way, um, so that you can kind of pivot back if you need to. Um, but I think it's one of those things that has so much potential. And I think it's, um, you we're going to hear more about it as the ungrading movement continues. Um, Jesse Stommel's work in ungrading. Susan Bloom has a has an edited collection mm -hmm. coming out soon on on contract well, on excuse me ungrading. That's going to be a great compilation. So I think it's going to become more popular because I think the contracts and you know and that, that perspective grading are probably more realistic to the kinds of feedback that students are going to get when they graduate and move into whatever their career roles are. No one's mm -hmm. going to give them a, a ninety four percent when they turn in their first assignment at work. So I think it's more realistic to try it that way. Um, no, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, and, and a really, really rich answer. We've had Jesse Stommel as a guest on the program, did a really passionate, thoughtful mm -hmm. description of ungrading. Uh, mm -hmm. Bob Klein, uh, Bob, right now you might want to try jumping into another uh, room, uh, for the chat. So if you look on your screen at uh, either end of the screen, the very left or the right side, you'll see a kind of teal colored chevron. Uh, click one of those and you may be in a different room and that'll show people chatting from another room. Um, but I'll repeat back out loud uh, the highlights from chat as well to make sure. I don't want you to miss anything, Bob. Um, the, um, uh, we have more questions that are just coming in and, and I, I had some as well, but just to make sure it's the uh, vulnerability person is Brene Brown. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, Tom has another question. This is Tom Ames. Um, it has to do with large class sizes. And how do you reconcile those with the individualized attention that seems necessary? I wish there was a simple answer to that. Um, and there's there's just not, unfortunately. Um, I think there are ways that we can attempt to balance it because community building is going to be is crucially important. 
um, for hybrid courses, for online courses, just as it is in, in a face to face classroom, students need to feel comfortable with each other to be able to discuss your comments to, to throw things out there. Um, so some of the things I've, I've seen that people are suggesting are, especially if it's um, if it's not a synchronous class is to um, put students into small study groups. Um, so that they are always together throughout the semester or they're together with different groups for half of the semester um, so that they have that continued point of community and then you can kind of hop in and hop out of those um, of those environments and those classes um, as as necessary we can't get to all of them in the large class and you know being able to kind of say that I think it's it's again I think a lot of it has to do with just acknowledging the context you know um, having open video virtual office hours right, um, having a sign up sheet um, so that students can pop in and being available. Again, that's a boundary that you need to set. That doesn't mean that your, you know, your, your Zoom or your blue jeans is open all day, right? But there's, there's a set of hours that you will be available for students to just drop in and chat and get to know you a little bit. Um, I know folks who are kind of scheduling, you know, five or six students to jump into a chat with them for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So, so that they get some one-on-one -on -one time um, to chat with the professor and get to know them. And, and part of it, honestly, is just maybe some videos, um, videos that show you as a person, um, mm. as, as an introduction. Um, you can offer students the same opportunity um, at, to share a video, or if they choose not to, they could do an audio or they could do a, you know, a written introduction to themselves um, that, that humanize us in different ways. Um, as long as you're not requiring students to be on video or audio, I think, um, having them do what they're comfortable with um, adds the level of humanity that maybe puts some of that human connection together. Well, thank you. Um, that really, really helps. Uh, there's, there's more questions coming. I'm not getting to ask any. This is perfect. <laughs> um, and the, um, and this is another one from uh, from Raj. And Raj, forgive me for mangling your last name. Um, Devasagayam, I hope is the correct. Um, and uh, Raj asks this follow-up question. What's your advice uh, for uh, an acculturation onboarding of folks that will start their professional life remotely? How do I build community? Yeah, it, there's so many things that are affected by this that we didn't necessarily imagine were going to happen or, or could have prepared for. And Brian didn't even prepare for them and he knows everything that's gonna happen. <laughs> um, I think that it comes down to intentionality. I think it comes down to making a commitment. You know, if you're bringing someone into your department, if you're bringing someone into your unit that, you know, just having coffee hours with the whole department in a Zoom room and just sharing personal stories or, you know, having a joke, playing a game so that you can get to know each other a little bit. Um, but those are things that you have to intentionally do. It's you're not going to have those conversations where you just bump into someone in the hallway. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, my unit has been leveraging teams. Um, and, and we were very much a bump into the hallway, um, Microsoft Teams. Thank you. Um, yeah, Microsoft Teams. Um, and, you know, at first it was very much let's share information. But, you know, after a long time, you know, we're joking with each other and we're post posting GIFs and we're laughing at each other. Um, and it, it breaks up the day because you also, I, I've also found, and, and folks have said to me too, that it's very easy to feel disconnected from everyone. I don't know what my colleagues are doing in the same way that I would if I was, you know, walking past their offices. Yeah. So you feel like you're isolated from the work and who knows <laughs> what is everyone else doing? Am I doing enough? Am I not? Um, comparatively. So connecting to people in those human ways requires intentionality. Maybe that's a Slack channel that, you know, you intentionally keep up, or maybe that is a regularly scheduled time together online that isn't a meeting. Right. Mm. That, you know, yeah. my unit and I have we have lunch together on Zoom a couple of times a month. Right. And that's not about work. That's about what are you eating for lunch and what are you doing and nice. what's your furry coworker doing today? And, you know, so so we are human with each other and we can laugh with each other and then kind of go back with with a cup filled up a little bit more when we go back to the work. The cup filled up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's well said. I, I haven't been visited by my furry coworkers. <laughs> They're on either side of me right now. Uh, they're engaged in supervising. Um, we just I, got some junior, some junior uh, coworkers. So, we're <laughs> so they're running around somewhere. <laughs> that's guaranteed charisma. Um, yes. This is fantastic. Um, we uh, we had a, a couple of other questions um, have, have come in. No one wants to join us on stage right now, which is which is weird. Um, but the <laughs> questions are coming in, which is great. Um, 
And uh, this is one from uh, Sarah Sanagorio, uh, who is a wonderful person. And she writes, I support faculty in my role. Feeling overwhelmed by everything going on, they feel overwhelmed. I want to help them without drowning myself. Do you have any suggestions for those of us in support roles? Mm -hmm. Yes, compassion fatigue and secondary trauma are real. Um, and if, if you can't, that's the wrong word, if you don't have boundaries that you feel are solid, um, it will be difficult not to get pulled into that. Um, mm. And and it's it's challenging for us because we want to be compassionate. We want to be em empathetic and we want to support the people around us. You know, it's our goal to help people rise up um, and, and learn and contribute to the world. So of course we want to be there with them, um, but we are all, all overwhelmed. Um, and most of us are not mental health professionals. So some of the best things that we can do are to give people permission to be mediocre. That sounds terrible. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, most academics, we set our bars very high and that's great. But that's when we are more in a traditional experience and we don't have all this extra trauma on top of it. So what would it mean for you to step back enough to do what, especially if you're teaching, if you're teaching, how can you still achieve your course outcomes? How can you still be rigorous in ways that don't necessarily cause undue anxiety or overwhelm, right? And that's not just for your students, that's for you, right? You know, adding 10 formative assignments that you then have to grade, right? You know, that's, that's probably not protecting your mental health or your boundaries either. So I think I found it important to kind of, in some ways, I feel like I also, I, I'm giving people permission, you know, and it's what I needed too. I needed to hear, you have permission to step back. You have permission to slow down. You have permission to take care of yourself. Um, because when you take care of yourself, then only then can you help support others as well. Right. And that trickles out. And, and we have to model that, right? If we don't model taking care of, of ourselves and setting boundaries, the people around us are not going to do it as well. Right. And we, we don't do that very well in a traditional context. So really yeah. thinking about what we can manage, thinking about what we can handle and are willing to handle emotionally. Right. Emotions are not necessarily something that we like to talk about as faculty members. Right. We will talk about the intellectual stuff and the deliberative stuff. But but sharing emotions beyond I'm really busy and I'm crazy and blah, blah, blah. Right. That's not real. That's not connection. Um, so I think boundaries I, I <laughs> you know I, I don't know that there's another way you determine it is to really you have to set your boundaries for what you're willing to give of yourself and that's not selfish at all that's necessary this sounds like um, a lot of advice for uh, first responders mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah most of the compassion fatigue research comes out of nursing social work k-12 uh, Greg somehow keeps writing and he says, he quotes William Stafford saying, lower your standards and keep writing. Yep. I think Greg actually gave me that advice a couple of months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to bang that at me too. Um, there's, uh, you know, for, let me just ask you all, sorry, just one second on the chat, everybody, would you all mind if I quote some of your um, quotes, like the William Stafford one, and if I copy some of the uh, links that you shared uh, and some of the ideas, like Roxanne's mentioned, permission to feel, would you mind to put that all in a blog post? I, this is a really, really rich conversation. And I, want, I don't want to lose. I want to make sure that people get to see this now. Um, thank you. Thank you. And if you don't want me to use your name, just, just put that in there. And I won't. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, we, um, Sarah, thank you for that question. Uh, that is so, so mm -hmm. important. And academic yeah. staff are often left out in these conversations. Yes. Vital um, for people to see this. We also had a question from um, up north from Salem State. Uh, Stephen Oliver uh, has one about, um, I'm torn between limiting the amount of time students are on Zoom and wanting to help the students develop the capacity, stamina, and presence necessary to engage in this format. Thoughts? Good question, Stephen. Yeah, that, those are great questions. Um, well, and, and I think we can tell from our own experience how long we can stay in a Zoom call with stamina <laughs> or oh. how many back-to-back -back Zoom calls that we feel like we are mentally present and available and can, are at full capacity. Um, so I think just thinking about your own experience is a way to, to think about that first, right? Um, and part of it, I, again, part of it goes back to not necessarily knowing what 
technologies our students have, we can't assume that they can all be there at the same time with high quality synchronous connections. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think, you know, I think folks I know in faculty development are a lot of us are saying, you know, prepare for a fully remote class. And then those synchronous experiences and those face to face experiences are bonus touch points where you can dig into things in different ways. Um, but uh, allowing students to dig into the material asynchronously and think about it in that way can, can be very rich. There's, there, you know, it's it's a myth that online education is less than face to face education. You can build amazing experiences asynchronously with a synchronous component and you can hook students up so that they're collaborating and that they're working together. Um, so I think you just have to find what the balance is for you. And also keep in mind that your students are probably taking three or four other classes, right? Two, two to four other classes. And if those faculty members are expecting them to be on Zoom an hour a day, right? And they have five, four classes in a day, that's exhausting. And you're not gonna be your best to learn in that context. So how can you use those synchronous moments for um, engagement and connection and, and maybe even deepening um, some of the learning? but also making that available to the students who can't necessarily be there. I know folks who are um, giving students the opportunity to video record answers to things or video record um, a presentation or, or audio record that. Um, so thinking about different modes of students being able to participate in that context is, is, is an opportunity for creativity really. Um, you know, when we give students a little bit more agency over how they show mastery of, of an element, then um, they come out more strongly and, you know, we all are going to be working with less attention than we would usually give because a good chunk of our mental capacities and our emotional capacities are dealing with the uncertainty of the world right now. I, right? I, I have a specific question about that. And this is, this is the part of the program where if we haven't addressed the future enough, we I, I try and <laughs> touch people towards the future. And, and I think this is a natural question. Do you, Remember back in the spring, there were all these discussions about different grading paradigms, um, mm -hmm. you know, moving to pass fail. And uh, right. um, I wonder um, if we're going to see that happen for this uh, for this fall and, and not just because of COVID. I, I fear that um, the uh, elections coming up for November, yeah. regardless of, of one's politics, I, I think the passions of that and the mm -hmm. disruptions um, may also, I, I wonder if we're just going to, ratchet down across higher education, our, uh, our assessment and our work expectations? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that we can still have expectations, right? Maybe not extremely high expectations, but high expectations. Um, we can still have goals. We can still have learning outcomes. All of our courses should have learning outcomes. And our goal is not to dumb down the content at all. It's still to meet those, those objectives, but to let the objectives guide. And a lot of times objectives, really true learning objectives, don't necessarily lend themselves to an A through F scale, right? Or, you know, mm -hmm. what's the difference between an 83 and an 84 on, on a test, um, right? So uh, the grading is an unnatural thing, right? You can assess people in different ways that don't require a letter grade at the end of it. Right, it's you know their mastery-based learning, team-based learning, um, service learning. All of those things you show contributions and you show some level of mastery of content or engagement with the content that don't require a letter grade. You can assess without grading. Right. I think it's important to kind of split those up, and you know that's a, a potentially a potential area of hope. Right. Maybe we do start thinking about you know the research shows us that that grading is not motivating. Uh, great grading is motivating for cheating, right. right? But it's it doesn't help students learn. So you know how do we change that paradigm? Why do we do it in the first place? Uh, Lisa Durf no likes it. I don't know anyone who likes grading. <laughs> no, I agree. It's 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 um it's like toothbrushing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Durf points out mastery learning is the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Charles Finley follows up in his previous comment by saying that this. Registrars require grades at the end. We have to change yes. that, that whole system. Yes. Um, but we we are uh, very very close to the. Uh, gosh, we're two minutes from the end of the hour. Oh wow! And I want to make sure people are here. And it also to say, um, I think switching between Zoom and Shindig actually is pretty good. Um, I, I don't. Um, I have yet to feel Shindig fatigue. Um, mm, there you go. 
but it's uh, always changing. Things are always moving around. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and uh, we, um, I'm wondering, is there anything you want to leave us with? Any any advice? I mean, you can tell you've got a swarm of folks here from deans, mm -hmm. technologists, mm -hmm. librarians, faculty, yeah. students. Anything you want to tell us to take away with besides everything else? I mean, anything, anything else? Right, right. Um, self care is not just getting your nails done and getting a massage, taking a walk. Those are wonderful things that can support your health, but self-care is boundaries, right? Setting boundaries for what you're willing to give emotionally, intellectually, um, knowing that again, we are in a time of crisis. Um, this is a very different world that we live in right now. And we were surrounded by trauma and the secondary trauma of what's happening in the world and the anxiety and the fear of it. It's okay to not necessarily maybe hit the bar that you were attempting a year ago because maybe that bar wasn't necessarily an important bar anyway. It just, maybe that's just what you thought the next step was. Right. So now is maybe a good time to just kind of take stock, right? What is it that I do really value? What is it that I love about what I do? How can I focus on those things and support other people as they focus on the things that they value um, while still setting boundaries for myself to take care of myself and my family in this context? That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful message to leave us with. A very, very powerful one in this in this extremely strange time. Um, do you, um, well, I, I have to ask, you do so much. Um, what's the what's the best way that we can keep up with all that you do? Um, you can check out my website, rebeccapoprework.com. Um, I'm gonna start blogging again soon. I let myself stop blogging because I needed bandwidth for other things. Um, so there are resources there. Um, in terms of thinking about productivity before agile faculty was about faculty productivity long before um, the pandemic, but there are some strategies in there that will probably useful for um, for managing your work and, and that overload right now ways to think about and, and um, represent your work visually. Um, I think, you know, that book's available. The new book about redesigning liberal education is, is available, but also please just reach out. Um, you can contact me through the website and I'm happy to chat with you, whether that's in a formal capacity um, as a coach or just as some, someone to lend an ear. Well, that's fantastic. You, you have, you, you've won a whole bunch of fans right here. There's just a, a whole Thank bunch you all. of folks who uh, are, are delighted and, um, and inspired by, by all of your comments. And uh, I, I wanted to thank you. That's, um, thank um, you. that's very, very remarkable. If um, uh, friends, everybody, um, if, if you have ideas about how we can follow up with this, um, I've seen so far discussions about, well, obviously bringing Rebecca back on a daily basis, clearly, clearly, but, <laughs> but, um, but, um, but, right? um, but we've had some discussion about um, uh, following up on this task um, by having a, um, um, uh, a men's uh, group to look for that or anything else, please just, um, just let us know. And I'll follow up with a blog post uh, later on. Again, Rebecca, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, Brian. Well, I want to respect everybody's time, uh, and again, in the pursuit of boundaries. Uh, let me just point out that uh, next week's sessions, or the next couple of months' sessions, are coming up with all kinds of topics. Uh, again, just go to tinyurl.com slash forumfall2020. Um, if you'd like to keep the conversation going, you know how to do it. We have all kinds of ways in social media. And uh, if you want to go back into the past, look at our previous sessions, including sessions with on um, self-care and on uh, grading, just go to F tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And uh, above all, stay safe, everybody. This has been a terrific conversation. Thank you very, very much for all of that, uh, all of your thoughts. And uh, I wish you the best. Please take care and be safe. Bye-bye.